I think in my, my, my sense is yes. I think the, the survival of patients has improved over time and probably will continue improving over time as well. Um, but I don't know if it's because, you know, we're better doctors or there are better treatments or there are just better patients. You know, I think nowadays uh, patients are very well informed of what is out there. They know a lot about the disease, specifically the, the population of patients with Waldenstrom's. I have the privilege to work with you and the IWMF and, and, and basically see how well educated the patients are and how much on top of their disease they are and how much they understand the disease. So um, I think that has a lot of value. I think um, a patient knowing their disease, understanding their disease, being an active participant on their own care, I think that actually is what <laughs> makes probably patients live longer, you know? And obviously I think our treatments help a little bit. I think the doctors, you know, help a little bit too, but I think that the patient's uh, knowledge and being an active participant in their, in their own, you know, uh, care, I think that's probably what's making one of the biggest differences here. Welcome to Cure Talks. I'm Priya Menon, your host. Today's show is part of our innovative series where we discuss breakthrough treatments and research. Uh, we will continue our discussion on Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. The focus of today's discussion is diagnosis, treatments, and management of the condition. The featured guest on Cure Talks today is Dr. George De Castillo, Clinical Director at Bing Center of Waldenstrom's Macroglobulinemia. He is a senior physician and an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Joining Dr. Castillo on the panel is Pete Dinardis, patient advocate and trustee of International Waldenstrom's Foundation. Welcome to Cure Talks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Castillo, as I understand it, and I was just explaining to Pete here, Waldenstrom's is a tough uh, condition to kind of completely understand. So uh, in layman's language, it's a rare type of cancer that begins in the white blood cells. Uh, the abnormal white blood cells produce a protein that accumulates in the blood, impairs circulation and causes complications. Am I right? Yeah, I think that that is a, a very a good way to put it. Um, it is a type of blood cancer, specifically a type of blood cancer that falls within the category of a lymphoma. Mm -hmm. And uh, the malignant cells are lymphocytes that are typically nesting in the bone marrow of, of all of us. It's just that in patients with Waldenstrom, they have many more cells accumulating in their marrows. And one of the functions of these cells is to produce a protein called IgM, which, which is an antibody that is supposed to be protecting our, our bodies from infections, but in patients with this condition, because they have too many of these cells, the levels of these IgM also increases. So patients uh, tend to have anemia, they tend to have you know, an increased thickening of the blood because of the excess of IgM. And sometimes the IgM can cause other problems too, like nerve damage and increased size of lymph nodes and organs. You know, There's a portion of patients who are asymptomatic as well. So as you said, it is... Uh, interesting disease to take care of. And I believe uh, it also continues to be a clinical challenge for physicians. Um, and so uh, like, I want to start at the right at the beginning, you know, uh, and start with diagnosis. What does the diagnosis process involve? I mean, that, that, that's a great point. Uh, most of the times uh, to make a formal diagnosis of Waldenstrom's, I think for me is very important because in my clinic, this is, you know, what we see. So I want to make sure that uh, the patient sitting in front of me actually has mm -hmm. this condition. Um, so I think the first uh, uh, factor that we almost always find, almost always first, not always, but almost always, is an increase in this level of IgM. There's actually a blood test. And um, what happens, sometimes patients have anemia, sometimes patients have uh, numbness in their feet. Patients sometimes have just a, a normal value of a high protein level. You know, so there are many reasons why a physician will suspect something is not right uh, with the patient. They might not be thinking about the Waldenstrom's precisely, okay. but the number of tests they're going to be ordering can give us an idea that maybe this process is called Waldenstrom's. So when we see a high protein or a little bit of anemia or some other problems, what we, we, we tend to send in the blood is a test called electrophoresis of the blood. Yes. 
that really gives us a good idea of what how the proteins in the blood are. And that can give us a, a sense that a protein is just maybe being overproduced or over secreted. So once we have a, an excess of IgM detected in the blood, which is a blood test first, the second test almost always, and again, in some patients it's not the same sequence, but in most patients, the next uh, test will be to obtain a bone marrow biopsy. Mm -hmm. a bone marrow biopsy is a very um, relatively you know, small surgery, um, almost never complicates, uh, in which we take a, a piece of the bone from the pelvic area from a patient. And the size of the bone marrow biopsy is very tiny. I don't know if you can see this, but it's something about, it's probably about this size. Mm -hmm. You know, this is probably the size of, of the sample that we take. And we also take some fluid from the marrow and we send those for a multiplicity of tests that our pathologists are very familiar with to be able to identify why type of cell, what type of cell is the one that is, um, you know, accumulating abnormally in the samples and other features. We run genomic testing, uh, mutation analysis, and things of that nature. So what we tend to see in that sample is usually an excess of lymphoma cells. And these lymphoma cells have a very specific feature. They're called lymphoplasmacytic cells. And so it's very specific for Waldenstrom's. And any excess of, of these cells beyond what is expected is obviously another part of the diagnosis of patients with Waldenstrom's. More recently, I would say over the last 10 years, uh, we have been able to refine that diagnosis by actually checking for the presence of mutations in these malignant cells. And there is a specific gene uh, called the MYD88. You know, we all have that gene, but it's not mutated in us and in, in, in the hence it's working well. But in patients with Waldenstrom's, they have a mutation in that gene. And based on our experience, more than 90% of the patients with Waldenstrom's can have a mutation in that gene too. So when a patient comes to see me, blood tests with an IgM elevation, the bone marrow biopsy showing these, you know, excessive number of lymphoplasmacytic cells and the presence of the mutation, you know, uh, the MYD88 mutation. I think in that context, with these three factors, I think the diagnosis of Waldenstrom's is, is very suspicious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so once it's diagnosed, what is the next step? Like I, I'm, you know, trying to understand if monitoring instead of intervention is an option at all. Uh, or what what would be the most important uh, factor uh, which is considered uh, you know for good progn prognosis because I was reading up that if you are diagnosed early age age is a very uh, important factor that is considered for a good prognosis so can you talk a little bit about that yeah of course I think that's a very important factor um, so in my clinic for example I would say probably about one out of three patients that I see for the first time in my clinic have the diagnosis, but they are asymptomatic. They have no symptoms from the mm -hmm. disease. They don't have anemia. They don't have neuropathy. Their IgMs are high, but they don't have viscosity problems. They don't have uh, enlarged lymph nodes or organs. They have no other manifestation of the disease besides the fact that they have an IgM and the bone marrow is involved. So those patients, we call them asymptomatic Waldenstrom's or some other people call it inactive, smoldering. There are different ways of calling these patients. Um, so these patients are better left untreated. I mean, those are the patients that we tend to monitor without intervention. And there are many reasons for that. Um, so as of today, you know, we don't have a cure for wild mushrooms. We're working on that very hard. And obviously with the support of the IWMF in other uh, centers and research centers all over the world, we're all working towards a cure for this disease, but we don't have a cure as of today. So when we Think about that, we don't treat then Waldenstrom's to cure, which is one of the reasons we treat patients with cancer. The other reason we treat patients with cancer is to prolong their survival. Mm -hmm. you know? And in patients with Waldenstrom, their survival has been increasing over time. And over right now, many patients live for decades. So it is very unlikely that a six-month treatment or a year treatment or two-year treatment is going to change a 20-year survival. So in most cases, and I want to say most, we don't prolong the survival of patients with Waldenstrom's, which is another common reason why we need we treat patients with cancer, right? Either to cure or to prolong their survival. But in those two scenarios, the treatment of patients with Waldenstrom's doesn't really apply precisely. So when why then when do we need to treat patients with Waldenstrom's? And and the current um, approach is to treat patients who are symptomatic. Mm -hmm. For one, they have to have symptoms that are severe enough to alter the patient's quality of life. And second, the symptoms 
has to be related to the disease. So they have to, there's two different factors that we need to have in mind because we can have patients who have symptoms from the disease that are very minor. And sometimes those patients might prefer not to get treated and that is okay. On the other hand, patients can have severe symptoms that might be the disease, but if you look a little deeper, it is not the disease. So it's better not to treat those patients because those symptoms are not going to get better with treatment, right? So we, we need to be very careful about that. So I think bottom line, if we have a patient with asymptomatic disease or minimally symptomatic disease, I think those patients are better left untreated. Those patients actually, based on recent research from the Mayo Clinic, those patients who are asymptomatic untreated actually have a normal life expectancy when you compare them with other individuals without Wabersham's of the same, the same age, sex, and race in this country, their life expectancy is normal. So for all those reasons, I think monitoring is a very important aspect of the care of patients with Wabersham's, and specifically patients who are asymptomatic. Now, most patients will need treatment at some point in their, in their course of their disease. You know, even the patients who are asymptomatic, about 80% of those patients will need treatment within 10 years. Uh, in about two thirds of the patients that come to my clinic, they already come symptomatic. So they need to be treated. And those symptoms, as I said earlier, you know, range from anemia to neuropathy, yeah. to viscosity, to increased lymph nodes and things like that. And, and that, at that moment is when we start thinking about treating. Now you asked me a question, asked me a question about prognosis. And um, uh, there are many ways of looking at prognosis. You know, I would say the most important aspect of, in terms of prognosis is the age of the patient. Um, patients who are younger tend to live longer and patients who are a little bit older tend to be shorter. But I mean, th that is life itself. You know, We yeah. did a study uh, some years ago in which we were separating you know, the different uh, causes of death in patients with Waldenstrom's and we realized that really the not Waldenstrom related causes were more more prominent, more, more you know, more um, uh, more prominent in patients with Waldenstrom's. So most patients with Waldenstrom's do not die of Waldenstrom's. They die with it. They not they don't die of it. So mm -hmm. there are other causes that that you know drives the the survival of these patients. And obviously, I think age is an important marker of that specific aspect. There are other values that we looked as well: the IgM levels, the hemoglobin levels, things like that. I think an important aspect of treat of of all this is to how well the patient responds to treatment. And that sometimes is hard to predict. You know, some patients respond fantastically well, and sometimes patients do not respond so well. And again, that is also something that we need to have in mind. But that is not something we can predict very early on by seeing the patient. I think it's more important to see the patient, follow the patient, see how the patients are doing, and then we can get a better sense down the road how well the patient is going to do. Uh, you did mention mutations, MYD88, and so uh, does these mutations, whether MYD88 or CXCR4 mutation affect your treatment decisions, and do you look for clinical trials for these patients since, they, you know, because of worse outcomes with standard therapies? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're speaking our language, which is very nice. Uh, so so the, the whole genomic profile concept with the MYD88 mutations that we see in over 90% of patients with the CXCR4 mutations that we've seen about a third of patients with Waldenstrom's, and now more recently, the TP53 mutations that we've seen about five to 10% of the patients, you know, there are specific genomic profiles that we can use to tailor treatment options. I don't, I don't wanna say that those are the main drivers of our treatment options, but they can definitely help us tailor treatment options. Uh, in patients with mid disease only, for example, which is about half of the patients, they have only the immediate mutation, that's all they have. I mean, those patients tend to do relatively well, specifically with the newer treatments, uh, like oral agents, like PTK inhibitors, for example, they tend to do very yeah. well with them. Uh, patients with CXR4 mutations, they're a little bit different. These patients tend to have higher IgM levels. They tend to have a higher risk of hyperviscosity and have even more uh, bleeding complications as well. They respond a little less well to PTK inhibitors. They respond, but they don't, not as good as the patients without CXR4 mutations. But in these patients, chemotherapy, for example, works very well. Uh, Protosmin inhibitors, which is another family of medications, tend to work very well as well. And then we have a very tiny group of patients without MID-88 or CXCR4 mutations. That's about 5 to 10% of the cases. You know, uh, those patients uh, really respond even less well to BTK inhibitors. And those patients, we tend to use chemotherapy or protosmin inhibitors in that scenario. Now there's a, another mutation I mentioned, the TP53 mutation. That is a mutation that we have seen in many other blood cancers, 
um, like chronic lymphocytic leukemia and other conditions, myeloma. So mm -hmm. wild mushroom patients also, some of them have these mutations too. And if, characteristically, these uh, mutations have been associated with chemotherapy resistance. So uh, these patients tend to not respond very well to chemotherapy. So if a patient has these mutations, we tend to use non-chemo treatments on those patients, uh, like BTK inhibitors or BCL2 antagonists or proton inhibitors. So as you can see, you know, we are starting to have genomic profile into account when we make uh, treatment decisions in these patients. Uh, so, Dr. Kislo, what's on the horizon for uh, treatment, um, you know, some novel therapies that will impact standard of care? Can you talk a little bit about that? And then maybe, you know, talk about the recent clover trial results, the targeted therapy for Waldenstrom's. Yeah, of course. So, I mean, um, I, I think it's an exciting time for Waldenstrom. I mean, it has been an exciting time for the last 10 years. So, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a momentum and I think it's, I think it's great to see that. Um, so as I said earlier, we have the standard treatments, right, that most patients will be exposed uh, if they got to be treated today, for example. We do have chemotherapies, we have protein inhibitors, we have antibodies, um, yeah. we have a B, you know, BTK inhibitors and BCL2 antagonists. I mean, in that list has grown in my lifetime, which is an amazing thing, thing to see. Uh, for the future, I think there are a number of uh, treatments that are um, interesting. I mean, number one, we're starting to use... Um, combinations of these agents. You know, we're starting to see what we call triplets, which is essentially three agents yeah. at the same time. And, and that has worked very well for CLL, that has worked very well for myeloma. So I can I understand the, the interest of the of studying, you know, triplet therapy, triple therapy in patients with Waldenstrom's. Now these triple therapies are going to include BTK inhibitors. And one of the downsides of BTK inhibitors, I would say, is the fact that they have to be taken indefinitely. So these triplet therapies might actually explore the concept of using the power of BTK inhibitors without the need of having to take BTK inhibitors indefinitely. You know? So I think this new generation of clinical trials combining BTK inhibitors with a finite duration uh, of the therapy is actually a very important uh, study. And one of, an example is the Canadian study that is actually looking at acalabrutinib, bendamustine, and rituximab. You know, and acalabrutinib will be in for about a year and then everybody will stop therapy. So I think that's an, an, a very interesting study in that family of, you know, of, of trials. The other uh, trials that are of, of great importance are the ones that we call non-covalent BTK inhibitors. These actually are third generation BTK inhibitors. And one of the other issues with BTK inhibitors was the fact that they were associated with some bleeding issues, associated with cardiac problems like arrhythmias and things like that. So there's a new, new generation of BTK inhibitors um, that actually might be effective even when the prior BTK inhibitors do not work anymore. And they seem to have also a lower risk of bleeding and lower risk of arrhythmias. So the two agents that are in development currently are pirtobrutinib and nemtabrutinib. So these are non-covalent BTK inhibitors. Waldenstrom patients can be enrolled in these clinical trials. And I think those are a very interesting um, group of, um, of agents. The other line of a branch of research where Waldenstrom patients are getting into is actually immunotherapy. You know, and uh, one of the agents of interest is the one, uh, the CLR131 from the Clover study, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, mm -hmm. We do have now antibody drug conjugates. Uh, there is a study with long castoximab tessirine, which is approved for uh, diffuse rash B cell lymphoma. It's an antibody drug conjugate targeting CD19. Uh, it's already FDA approved for other conditions. So that's another study running. And very shortly, we will start with the CAR T cell programs for wild mushrooms as well. They have, there are a few CAR T cell programs in the country that can enroll patients with Walden Shrooms, but the, the, there's, an, there's a program, the Zuma 25, that is going to start actively enrolling specifically patients with Walden Shrooms. And I think that's going to start later this year or very early next year. So we're very interested in that. There's another family of medications called BITES. It's called bispecific T cell engagers. And there is a number of them already being uh, tested in CLL in Waldenstrom's and, and sorry, in CLL and uh, diffuse large visceral lymphoma. And obviously we want to be looking into those bites for patients with Waldenstrom's as well. So as you can see, very interesting time, you know, in patients with Waldenstrom's, in which we're going to be many more treatment options. Now the Clover study specifically, uh, I think is of interest. Number one, uh, CLR131 is a, you know, a medication that was given a breakthrough designation by the FDA specifically 
to look at Waldenstrom's macrorenemia. They're looking at other conditions as well in the clinical trial, but one of the major uh, foc the major focus um, is actually up in, in patients with Waldenstrom's. So uh, this is an interesting mechanism of action because there's nothing that we have uh, similar to that, you know, in anywhere else, which uh, which I think the, the the impactful aspect of things. So this is a phospholipid drug conjugate or a PDC. And basically what they're doing is uh, they're taking advantage of the fact that there's specific distribution of lipids in the membrane of the malignant cells, specifically in patient in, in Waldenstrom's, that is different compared to the normal cells. And in that way, you know, it seemed to be targeting the malignant cells in a more specific manner than the, than the normal cells in that specific situation. So they use, uh, take advantage of that. They actually have a radioisotope associated with the, with the drug. And in that way, the radioisotope, which is given intravenously, you know, finds the malignant cells with that specific fat distribution in the cell membrane, and then delivers the, the payload specifically to the malignant cells. Uh, there is already some data showing early efficacy. This was presented at one of the national meetings last year. There were small samples, so it's about six patients, but we already seen some early um, efficacy with these uh, with these agents, so I think it's going to be an important aspect of things. Number one, the mechanism of action is distinct. Uh, number two, I think biologically speaking, makes sense. And number three, it's a it's a finite duration treatment. You know, so patients go in, they get just a few infusions, separated over a couple of uh, a couple of months, and the patients are done. You know, so I think uh, I, we we need to. I will be very interested in seeing what the results of a, of a study like this is going to be in the future. Uh, what what is the eligibility criteria for this trial? So for this study, patients need to have uh, been previously exposed to other lines of therapy. So this is not for a frontline treatment specifically. And I think the ideal uh, candidate will be a candidate who have already been exposed to the standard regimens, right? A rituximab containing regimen of some kind and a BTK inhibitor of some kind. Um, okay. And that will be, in my opinion, that is where the unmet need is, and, and I think it's very interesting that this study is going to be able to target this population. The second population that I think is of, of great importance is the population with this condition called Bing Neal syndrome. Mm -hmm. Bing Neal syndrome is a rare condition in which the Wollstrom cells gain access to the brain and the spine and causes neurological deficits there. Uh, that happens in about one to two percent of patients, so it's not a very common issue. But not too many drugs that we have available actually cross, you know, into into the brain. You know, the brain is protected actually by a specific tissue. It's actually there's an actual physical protection. So a lot of the treatments that we use for patients with Waldenstrom's that will go everywhere in your body will not penetrate into the brain and therefore will not treat Big Neal syndrome. So currently, for example, PTK inhibitors cross the blood-brain barrier, and some few chemotherapies that cross the blood-brain barrier. In this medication, CLR131 is one of those as well. So a, a group of patients with Waldenstrom's in this study will probably have Big Neal syndrome. And this is another population that, from my perspective, is another big and mid need. And I think this uh, study will potentially, you know, help develop okay. treatment for these patients. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kessilo. Uh, I have a few more questions, but I'm going to let Pete ask his before, uh, you know, I'm keeping, you know, being mindful of time here. Uh, so Pete, all yours. Thanks, Priya. <clears throat> and uh, thanks, Dr. Castillo. Thanks to both of you for uh, setting this up and, and having this presentation for the WM community. Uh, I know as a WM patient myself, I really appreciate this. And uh, any knowledge we obtain is great knowledge to help us uh, better manage our diseases. Um, so I guess one question I have is, I know, Dr. Castillo, you mentioned a lot of the newer uh, BTK inhibitors and the immunotherapy and the bites that are coming down the road. Um, would it ever, do you foresee a, a time when uh, that would be the standard for first line of therapy as opposed to bendamustine and rituxan or something along those lines? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, obviously, um, you know, I think it's a little challenging in Waldenstrom's. And the reason for that, as you very well know, uh, the, the, you know the, the ideal way to replace a standard of therapy is actually through a randomized study, you know, in which you can actually show either benefit in terms of efficacy or safety. So in the absence of randomized studies, you know, it, it's going to be very difficult to categorically replace you know, one treatment option over another treatment option. 
But um, I do believe that the newer agents that are coming up are safe, are very effective, and um, it, it provides patients with, this, with a different approach to their disease. So uh, currently, for example, I'm using a lot of BTK inhibitors in the frontline setting, for example, you know, and uh, I'm still using, uh, there, I use, there are some patients in whom I do recommend, you know, chemotherapy and other approaches like that. So, but I cannot tell you that there is one treatment that is the best treatment in the frontline patient of, of, in treatment of patients with Waldenstrom's. We tend to try to be a bit more personalized. So I think what we need is large randomized studies to be able to show that that one specific treatment is superior to other treatments. And that will be probably the best way to replace a standard of care. Okay, thank you. And then as far as uh, uh, creating those large randomized studies, what's the process? What, uh, how do we help make that happen? Yeah, it, it, it is difficult because obviously it entails uh, an expense, right? Uh, uh, sometimes either a pharmaceutical company or an academic organization is willing to take on. Uh, number two, we need the compromise of multiple centers to randomize, to try to run studies like that. We need multi center collaboration. So we need to have the commitment and the compromise of a, a number of different centers willing to work together to be able to enroll patients in a specific study. So in that sense, for example, um, the French and the Italians and the Germans are really good at this. You know, they, they, they put a, a national randomized study and every patient that goes into an academic center will go into the either standard of care or the clinical trial. It's only one clinical trial available for everybody else. So this, the, the enrollment on, in these type of situations is much more effective. In the United States, it's a little bit more difficult. Number one, because we're not uh, working a lot together in Waldenstrom's specifically. And number two is because there are so many clinical trial options, right? And so when you go to a center or any center, they're potentially competing, you know, studies running against each other for a limited and, and small <laughs> number of patients. So that is potentially an issue. So we are um, trying to set up a clinical trial network, a United States clinical trial network. And we are doing this in collaboration uh, with the Mayo Clinic and other centers um, across the United States to try to at least start you know, the idea of creating a clinical trial network. A clinical trial network of this nature actually existed in the past and it was very, very effective, but with the new regulations and all that it was a bit more difficult to sustain an effort like that. So we need to kind of recreate that same idea uh, for, for the new for the new era, so we can actually enroll patients uh, more rapidly um, and, and provide the best care to these patients as well. That's great, thank you. Yeah, we'll be looking forward to that for sure. Um, uh, another question I have is you you were mentioning the uh, third line or third generation of BTK inhibitors that are coming along that are uh, have uh, less uh, harmful side effects. Um, can you speak a little more about like if, if someone is taking an alkylating agent like bendamustine, what are the side effects you should look for? And then on the flip side, a BTK inhibitor, what should a patient be uh, looking out for to communicate with their doctor that they're having problems in a certain area? Yeah, so I mean, uh, bendamustine and rituximab is, uh, you know, one of the standard treatments for patients with Waldenstrom. So we've been using this regimen, you know, for you know, almost... 10 to 15 years and, and has been extremely effective. Um, the qualities I think of bendamustine and rituximab is, is, is relatively easy to give. It's two days every four weeks for six cycles maximum, and then you are done with therapy. Um, it's an intravenous approach, so you need to go to the infusion room to receive it. Uh, and during the treatment, patients are going to have uh, decreased white blood cells, decreased platelets, uh, decreased hemoglobin, constipation, rashes. So there's a lot of potential issues associated with the chemotherapy exposure and administration, which you know a lot of doctors are very familiar with. I think one of the major concerns that I have personally is the fact that there is a small risk of developing myeloid problems associated with the chemotherapy exposure. And it's not very high. You know, it's probably about a 1% or 2%, or, although some people have challenged me on that whenever I say that, and they think it's actually a higher risk of having these myeloid neoplasms. And this could be myelodysplasia, it could be acute myeloid leukemia, and these myeloid neoplasms actually are not very easy to treat when the patients do develop this secondary to exposure to chemotherapy. So I think, in my opinion, that is probably the, 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 the largest issue from my perspective. And obviously, when I treat a patient who's 55, um, that concern is different when I treat a patient who's 75. You know? So we need to have these personalized discussions 
uh, with patients. Now, in the era of, uh, of COVID-19 uh, infection in the pandemic, you know, the risk of infections is way much higher while patient is undergoing active chemotherapy and can be prolonged for six to 12 months beyond the completion of chemotherapy. So some patients don't like the idea, you know, of being, you know, recluse, kind of recluse to some degree, protecting themselves, up to some, you know, and, and that would be another potential issue with treating patients with bendamustin and rituximab. Now, uh, when we think about BTK inhibitors, uh, it's a very different way of treating patients with Waldstrom's because patients take, you know, a few pills every day, and that's all they have to do. You know, there's no visits to the infusion room and things of that nature. Um, these treatments are different in the sense that they are indefinite in duration. So patients need to be taking these medications indefinitely. So for as long as the medication is working, controlling the disease, and there are not unacceptable side effects and the disease is not progressing, you know, then the patients need to continue these treatments. And just to give an idea, about 20% of the patients who started the initial clinical trial in 2012 are still taking the medication today. So that's about a 20% rate of 10 years of longer duration of benefit. So on one hand, I have a number of patients who tell me, well, I'm already taking a bunch of pills every day. I don't mind taking another pill. And some patients are like, I don't like the idea of taking a pill indefinitely. So it has to do a lot too with, with what the patient thinks might be the right thing for them. Now, the side effects of BTK inhibitors are very distinct. We do have, uh, I like to divide the side effects in two different groups, the short-term side effects and the long-term side effects. The short-term side effects are the, uh, the ones that patients will have a little bit of diarrhea, some bloating, maybe some reflux, some rashes. You know, it, those are very easy things up to some degree to manage. And most of them will actually get better over time. You know, um, usually within two, three months of therapy, all those symptoms tend to improve. And the large majority of patients don't have to deal with those problems in the long term. Now, in the long term, we do have other issues. I mean, bleeding is a big problem uh, potentially in patients with uh, taking BTK inhibitors because these medications block how the platelets kind of stick together is very much like what aspirin does. So patients can bleed with surgeries, patients can bleed more than they usually with trauma and things like that. So we need to let them know, and this is not something that gets better over time. This is something that actually sustains over time. So patients need to be aware of this potential complication. And obviously if, if they have a trauma or they're gonna have a surgery, they need to talk to their doctors. So the medications need to be stopped sometimes for a few, for several days to try to minimize the risk of bleeding. Uh, the other problem that we see over time is actually hypertension. Actually, that increases over time as well. And we see that with rutinib, with acalabrutinib, and with xanobrutinib as well. So patients need to be aware of that. And the issue is uh, most of our patients are in the 60s and 70s, which is the age in which hypertension happens. So it's very difficult to discern if it's because of the BTK inhibitor or they were just going to have hypertension regardless. So we treat patients with hypertension normally as we would treat any other patient with hypertension. And only the hypertension is hard to control or the numbers are very high despite using one, two, three different medications. At that moment, we can consider maybe decreasing the dose of these drugs, but we have not seen them very often. And I think the main concern at the end of the day is just the arrhythmias, you know, the heart, uh, irregular heartbeats that patients can develop. Uh, the most common ones are atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter. Uh, this happens a little bit more often with ibrutinib, less often with xanobrutinib, but they do occur with all the BTK inhibitors, um, even acalabrutinib as well. So none of them are purely without these problems. And um, patients need to know that if they have uh, irregular heartbeats, if they're feeling that their heart fluttering, if they're feeling that their heart skips a beat, or any of these, they need to talk to their doctors so they can actually have a heart monitor placed and, and diagnosed appropriately. Because if you leave an atrial fibrillation um, untreated, uh, the risk of strokes go really high over time. So these patients need to have their heart rate control. They need to have, have their heart rhythms controlled sometimes, and they need to be on a blood thinner in some scenarios as well to prevent the potential risk of, of strokes in the future. So again, and the reason I focus so much on the toxicities, I mean, number one is the question that you asked, but number two is because the efficacy of these two approaches, bendamustin, rituximab, and BTK inhibitors, the efficacy rates are pretty similar. When we actually look at the depth of response, 
the time to the response, the durability of the response, all those numbers are almost superimposable in the absence of comparative trials. So I want to be very clear about that. There's no comparative studies. Um, in the, you know, but looking at the data and our experience, it seems to me that both approaches are almost equally effective. So we don't really talk too much about differences in, in efficacy, but rather the differences in how the medications are given, how long the medication is given, and the side effects that they have. Thank you. Yes, um, <clears throat> that, that's good to know. Um, as a uh, patient who's on a BTK inhibitor myself, I can, I can attest to the fact that my medicine cabinet has gotten a lot larger now uh, due to having to keep other things under control, but I can't complain because the WM is in check, so I'm happy with that. Um, with these, all of these different treatments that are available and, and the, the novel agents coming along recently, have you seen that uh, WM patients are living longer or, and that, or that they also have uh, a longer time period between needing to be retreated or I guess in the case of BTK inhibitors needing to change treatments? Yeah, I mean, obviously that, I don't think that has been formally evaluated, um, you know, in the, in the, in the most current era, uh, I did a study using the epidemiological database from the National Cancer Institute. It's called the SEER database. We published this 2015, 2016. So that was a, a while ago. And, and at that, at that moment, we actually did see that the um, average survival of patients with Waldenstrom's actually had prolonged over the last decades. So I, I do believe that there's a benefit uh, to patients. Uh, obviously, we have not repeated that analysis more recently. I think probably some are waiting a little bit longer to have a little bit more data to be able to you know, run additional analysis with more, uh, um, you know, more recent data. Uh, so I cannot really give you a, a very solid answer in saying the patients are right now, the patients are living longer. I think, yeah, I think in my, my, my sense is yes. I think the, the survival of patients has improved over time and probably will continue improving over time as well. Um, but I don't know if it's because, you know, we're better doctors or there are better treatments or they're just better patients. You know, I think nowadays uh, patients are very well informed of what is out there. They know a lot about the disease, specifically the, the population of patients with Waldenstrom's. I have the privilege to work with you and the IWMF and, and, and basically see how well educated the patients are and how much on top of their disease they are and how much they understand the disease. So um, I think that has a lot of value. I think um, a patient knowing their disease, understanding their disease, being an active participant on their own care, I think that actually is what <laughs> makes probably patients live longer. You know, and obviously I think our treatments help a little bit. I think the doctors, you know, help a little bit too. But I think that the patient's uh, knowledge and being an active participant in their, in their own, you know, uh, care I think that's probably what's making one of the biggest differences here. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I agree. But of course, uh, you know, we have to give credit also to uh, the amazing um, clinicians and researchers like yourself that are that are out there uh, every day trying to help patients and uh, and helping us on the path to getting uh, living longer with the disease or in spite of the disease, I should say. Um, so then with, you, you mentioned the uh, immunotherapy like CLR-131 and the CLOVER trial. Um, how exactly does that work? I mean, are, are patients, um, uh, do we go into a, a radiation machine or is it a radioisotope that we take orally or what, what's the mechanism of that? Oh yeah, it, those are intravenous, uh, intravenous therapies. Those are intravenous therapies. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you don't need to go into a radiation area or anything like that. There, there, there should be some minor radiation precautions um, with the handling of the medication and, and things of that nature. And also when the patient received it, maybe afterwards a little bit, you know, some, some minor precautions after that. We do have a lot of experience actually working with these radioisotopes. There were a number of medications approved. There are already a number of medications approved, different mechanism of action, but also using radioisotopes. Uh, for lymphomas and other cancers as well. So this is not, um, the, the, the use of the isotopes is not new precisely. Um, but what is new, I think, is the fact that they are, how they are taking advantage of, you know, of the profile of the membrane of the malignant cells, you know, to be able to deliver, you know, the, the isotope in a significant manner. But yeah, so it's that these are intravenous infusions. 
uh, my understanding is there has been no uh, infusion reactions compared to what we see with uh, you know with antibodies and things like that. Uh, one of the concerns um, when we think about radioisotopes is maybe prolonged uh, cytopenias, you know, when, when we have low hemoglobin, low platelets, low white blood cells because of the exposure. Uh, we have seen a little bit of that, but it's not very prolonged. And it seems to be reversible from the experience that we have so far reviewed. Um, obviously, uh, what I think we need is, is, is more patients, right? To be able to, you know, see a, num a larger number of patients, uh, follow those patients for, for longer, you know, to be able to understand a little bit more about the efficacy and the safety of, of these agents. But per se, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting, um, you know, compound. Thank you. Yes. Um, uh, uh, thanks for clarifying that. I was uh, just wondering the, the mechanism of that. But the, with regards to uh, the novel treatments that are coming down the road, or, or do there any, like if you have a, a WM patient that comes to see you, would you say, hey, you should really go to this trial because I think it's amazing? Uh, or are there a variety of options available to us? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I tend to be, um, you know, a, a guide to the patients and, and, you know, but, but the patient makes the decision at the end, you know? So I think there are a number of studies to be excited about, you know? Um, and I think looking at what the patient feels might be the right thing for them, I think is, is the most important aspect of things. So whenever I talk about a, a clinical trial for patients, so I talk about a non-covalent BTK inhibitor, uh, somebody who's multiply relapsed, you know, in that setting. So we talked about the protein, the, we talked about the ADCs, we talked about the CLR131, we talked about the non-covalent BTK inhibitors. And basically what I do is I just go over what I, you know, what I think might be the case in each of those scenarios. A lot of have to do with, you know, how available and where these, treat these treatments are. You know, some patients uh, might feel more appeal to go to the Mayo and they have a specific study there, while other patients might be more comfortable going to New York City and then there's another clinical trial available there. So I think um, it has to do with the design of the study, has to do with the mechanism of action, has to do with the geographical location of the, of the clinical trial as well, you know. And in, 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 in some cases, you know, even with our best efforts, uh, patients feel that a clinical trial is not right for them. You know, and, and they would like to try another standard treatment again. And, you know, so we need to be able to guide our patients. Um, I don't tell them what to do precisely, um, but, but, I, but, I, but I review with them the different aspects of, of the trials. And I review trials with my patients, uh, you know, trials that we do at Dana-Farber or trials outside of Dana-Farber, because at the end of the day, we're looking for the best interest of the patient. And if the best interest of the patient lies in a, in a clinical trial in in Tampa or, or Houston or, you know, Los Angeles, and so be it, you know, and I think that's the right thing to do. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think that if any patient should be, have a good dialogue going with their uh, clinician to discuss treatment options. And, and uh, you know, sometimes I was always taken aback when a doctor says, well, the decision is yours, which one do you want? And, and it is a, a, a conversation. It's not a one size fits all kind of scenario. So I appreciate that. No, I agree. And, it, and it's not a, a laundry list either. No, it's like you close your eyes <laughs> and just pick the one you want, right? It's not like that either. So it's, you need to talk about the pros and cons of each of them so you can make an informed decision. Now, the patient's decision, yes, but it has to be an informed decision. So we have to provide that information so the patients can have all, all the tools they need to, to, make, to make the decision. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then one, one other question I have is probably not a fair question to ask of you, but um, I, because I'm involved with the IWMF, I get to see, or I, I'm staying, I stay on top of what uh, treatments are approved or not approved in various countries. And uh, the novel agents have been game changers. And, you know, even the newer immunotherapies probably coming down the pike will also be, have a similar impact. But while they have less of a uh, physical um, uh, side effect that's detrimental, they now have a financial toxicity aspect of it that we hadn't had to deal with before. Um, do you see that changing uh, in the future for us? Like, are there any mechanisms going in place that are going to make the cost uh, more equitable, let's say, for patients? And it's probably not fair to ask you, but I'm 
just trying to you know advocate on behalf of patients that have to contend with this you know i uh, it's yeah I, I, it's a question that we get asked you know all the time and uh i think the answer to that question is cost effectiveness analysis which in the united states we are not very good at that uh outside of the united states i think the uk is probably one of the best places to to run a cost effective analysis that actually makes sense um the downside of cost effective analysis is that you have to put a price on a life and and that's why a lot of people don't like that approach right why do i need to put a price on a life but that's that's how you measure cost effectiveness and uh and that's that's a, i think a little bit of the problem obviously um in the United States at this time, uh, we are in a system that is able to sustain this type of uh, approaches without uh, making a formal cost analysis, um, you know, cost effectiveness analysis. It might be that in the future, that might be something that we need to start doing. Um, but again, I'm not in, in health policy, so I cannot tell you exactly, you know, how this is going to work. Um, there's a lot of issues with, uh, you know, the healthcare system not not uh, being able to negotiate, you know, prices with pharmaceutical companies, right? Uh, while this is done routinely outside of the United States, just to give an idea, the cost of ibrutinib outside of the United States is half of what the United States pays for that medication. And probably this is this is common knowledge. So. So, so I think that there is, there is, there's at some point, if we get to a point in which the system is not uh, sustainable, I think when I start looking into, into, into this type of um, cost effectiveness analysis, uh, at this time, at least in the United States, that doesn't seem to be um, too much of an issue, but I can foresee how this might be because there are going to be more and more agents, you know, coming out, uh, approved, uh, costly indefinite duration therapies. Um, so maybe at some point this will become a problem that we need to look into. Doesn't seem to be something we need to address right this second, but it might be the case in the future. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I, think, uh, I, I don't think I have any other questions other than, again, I just want to thank you and thank Priya for setting this up. Uh, uh, Dr. Kestlo and Pete, I think that was a great discussion. A lot of information shared. And, uh, you know, it's time to wrap up today's session. So thanks a lot uh, for joining us on Cure Talks today. Um, thank you both of you. And this talk will be made available on curetalks.com. So thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you, Priya. Thank you. Good to see you, Pete. Bye-bye. Take care. Take care. Take care.